Hi, this is Joel Duff, and we're back to talk about issues in creationism. The issue this week, the Noahic flood, post-flood boundary. Specifically, we want to talk about how when creationists try to draw the line and find this boundary, it has tremendous implications beyond geology. Young Earth creationists believe that a large portion of the geological column and the fossils that it contains were deposited during a single cataclysmic global flood event that occurred no more than 4,500 years ago. Christians therefore expect that somewhere in the vertical column of layers of rock and sediment that cover the earth, there lies a boundary or transition zone between layers of sediment that were deposited during the global flood and sediments that were deposited after this global flood event, and thus recorded the history and landforms of organisms from the flood to the present day. Put another way, somewhere in the geological column, there must be a layer of rock that contains fossils of mammals that perished in the flood above which are rocks which contain fossils of mammals that were descendants of mammals that have been preserved through the flood and then repopulated the post-flood world. Identifying this dividing point in the geological column record is essential to any hope of success of a young earth model of earth's geological history. In addition, I'm gonna argue here that any lack of consensus among your young earthers on where this boundary would also would also be a serious liability for creation biologists who are attempting to develop a young earth model to explain biological diversity. Given its importance, you will not be surprised that considerable effort over 40 years has been expended by young earth creationists to elucidate which layers of rock belong um, to these assumed major events in earth's history. What may be a surprise to the average young earth follower is that despite these efforts, there's no clear consensus about where this apparently elusive uh, flood, post-flood boundary should be found. Conflicting models and disagreements about the boundary, about this boundary abound in the creationist literature. What follows is a description of the two most popular young earth models for the origins of the geological column followed by an illustration of how the existence of these two models places constraints on and influences creationist conclusions about the history of living things. Let's take a look at the two most popular uh, YEC proposals. On the left side, you see a simplified schematic of the, ge of the geological column. This represents the general understanding of those at Answers in Genesis, and in particular, Dr. Andrew Snelling, their resident geologist. Everything before the Cambrian period, all right, Cambrian period would be right, right down here above the pre-Cambrian, uh, conventionally dated to about 540 million years ago, it's considered to be the product of the pre-flood from creation to the initiation of the flood. How much of this occurred during the seven-day creation is greatly debated uh, among creationists. The bulk of the geological column uh, is found from the Cambrian period through the Cretaceous. So the Cambrian is, is in this position, and then the Cretaceous ends up being uh, right up here, uh, a period uh, running from 500,000, 500 million years ago to uh, 66 million years ago. Um, and this part of, the, part of the geological column is credited to events that occurred um, during the flood. So these are all the flood layers that were laid down. That's the, the blue section here. Right? The entire Cenozoic era, which is conventionally dated from 66 million years to the present of the geological column, is credited to events that occurred after the flood. So therefore, ice ages, remnant tectonics, volcanism, et cetera, that all occurred during the Cenozoic is something that happened after the global flood and after uh, Noah had reappeared uh, from the ark uh, with his animals. All right, so that's the that is the uh, answers in Genesis model, which which I'll state is probably the most popular uh, understanding of what the flood layers are and what the post flood layer, where the demarcation point is between the flood and post flood uh, layers. So on the right side, we see a schematic representing the views of the Institute for uh, Creation Research and Timothy Clary, their resident geologist. Um, they agree that the post flood or the flood post flood boundary. Uh, is, I'm sorry, they agree that the pre-flood flood boundary uh, is the same along with Answers in Genesis, but they radically break from Answers in Genesis by placing the end of the flood deposits near the end of the Cenozoic era, right about the Neogene Quaternary period divide, right? And so the Quaternary period I'm indicating up here, 
Uh, and so the neogene uh, period is right below this. So they see this division right here, it's being that boundary layer between the, the flood deposits and the post-flood deposits. All right, conventional uh, dating places, it's just 2.6 million years ago. All right, their creation is to place the boundary lower and higher in the geological column, but these are the most two most popular views today. These views are clearly not compatible with each other. They result from focusing on very different sets of observations leading to different conclusions. Both of these views influence or have the potential to influence dozens of related creationist theories. In other words, I'm saying there are many different uh, things that uh, creationists believe that hang upon their placing the position of the flood uh, post-flood boundary. Let's look at how these contrasting views could influence these ministries' understanding of, in particular, the origins of biological diversity and their definition of a biblical kind in particular. Oh, one other thing I want to remind you, just, just to give you some frame of reference, the dinosaurs, where, where do you find dinosaur bones? They're all found in the Mesozoic, which would be uh, approximately this portion of the geological column. And so all dinosaurs uh, are found in both Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis both agree that all dinosaur bones that have been found are found in flood deposits. So there is some agreement between ICR and AIG. Let's look at how these contrasting views uh, could influence other views, right? So here we see an outline of the AIG and ICR hypothesis. So I've just simplified it down to these, these two contrasting views here. Let's consider how the fossil record of felines and how it would look projected onto these models. First, let's consider how that would look um, on the AIG deep boundary. I'm calling it the deep boundary because they see the, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary at 66 million years. So this would be the 66 million year mark, uh, which of course for them is 4,350 years ago. Sorry, 4,350. And up here, this is gonna be 4,350 years ago. All right, remember that Answers in Genesis and most creationists consider that all members of the feline family, all right, all these, and I'm just, I have a representation of a few of the living members of the feline family here, are, were preserved as a single biblical kind, all right? So Noah only brought two cats on the ark to preserve this kind, and then those two cats are thought to have diversified into all the living and extinct species of felines during the flood. Uh, biblical flood era. So what story does the observed fossil record tell us? All right? And so uh, these little red dots indicate like the position of various fossils that have been found that, that are uh, ancestors of various lineages that we see alive today, or in this case, we have discernible tiger uh, fossils uh, in the fossil record. And as you go farther back in the fossil record, there are fossils that are obviously felines, all right, cat-like, but not necessarily like any particular cat that's alive today. And the oldest fossil is found right here, about conventionally dated 33 million years ago in the fossil record. All right, so so what do we what do we observe first here? First, no feline fossils have been identified in any place on Earth in the pre-flood deposits. All right. There are no fossils known of felines in pre-flood deposits. And in the AIG model, there are no feline fossils that have been identified anywhere in the world in the, the portion of the fossil record that Answers in Genesis considers to be part of the flood. All feline fossils appear to be into the post-flood deposits in the AIG model. All subsequent diversification of felines into the species we see today and all the extinct species are all found preserved in these post-flood rocks and sediments. Superficially, this does fit the Answers in Genesis hyperspeciation model of biological diversity that they've been pushing in recent years, in which most or all species of mammalian fam families find their origins in the post-flood world. Of course, what this leaves unexplained is the complete absence of any observational evidence that felines existed prior to the flood, right? Any feline fossil that would be found here would actually represent a feline that lived in the pre-flood world because they got caught up in the flood and placed into these particular flood layers. But we don't see any evidence of that. All we see are felines that come into existence here. In other words, the felines appear out of, seem to appear out of nowhere in the post-flood record 
and then diversify into all the modern lineages of, of felines we have today. And answers in Genesis would place all of these in a single kind, saying God just created. And that's why the yellow line coming down here saying God created a cat kind, which ultimately then diversified into the different kinds of cats or felines that we have today. All right, so let's compare that. Yeah, let's consider the ICR flood deposit hypothesis, right? We have a very different story. Answers in Genesis and ICR agree on the observed facts of where the fossils are found in the geological common. In other words, those they say are those are the observations. That's those are the facts. They are, they agree to those, but their model requires them, or at least you would think that it would require them to explain these facts in very different ways. Notice that the feline fossils are observed in what ICR claims are rocks laid down by the flood. These felines must have been alive prior to the flood to have been found themselves captured or fossilized in these events. So all of these fossils, and there are many more, I'm just sort of giving some quick examples, actually this one too, right? All of these fossils are in the flood deposits and therefore all of those individuals that whose fossils are represented up here are actually found, must have been alive in the pre-flood world in order to be captured by this uh, large cataclysmic event. Now the story gets very perplexing and as yet, I think, unaddressed by ICR, at least that I'm aware. Fossils identified as lion-like or leopard-like or cougar-like are found in the flood deposits right up to what the ICR proposed boundary is, and then after the boundary in the post-flood deposits, right? So you have a fossil here of the lineage that leads to domesticated cats, uh, wild cats, and then you have fossils of these same types of cats right after the flood boundary. All right, what's going on here? How can lions, panthers, and leopards exist prior to the flood, but only two of the entire kind, and thus not all of these species be represented on the ark? Are we to believe that two felines were preserved in the, their kind walking off the ark, diversified back into the same lineages, lions, leopards, cheetahs, and panthers that existed prior to the flood, but whose lineages were destroyed by the flood? Let's take a look at what that would look like. So in the ICR model, it makes more sense to interpret this as, okay, all of these different fossils were representatives of organisms that lived before the flood, diversity before the flood, but all of that diversity was destroyed except for one lineage. That one lineage then, uh, if, if Noah preserved just a single lineage of all these cats, and there really is just one cat kind or feline kind, it would have to have diversified back into lions, right? And tigers and leopards and panthers and cheetahs and so forth and cats. Um, and each one of these represents something very similar to a lineage that existed prior to the flood. Maybe the, 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 the simpler explanation would be to say, you know, let's, let's move on to this. Maybe the simpler explanation would be to say that, hey, maybe this lineage right here that looks a lot like a lion diversified in the original pre-flood world. And this is something that ICR and both AIG might, might say that uh, organisms were diversifying uh, before the flood and produced these various lineages, all of which were captured in the flood, but only one of them is represented on the ark. And then that lineage then diversified after exiting the ark, right? Now, what, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I think would be a little bit easier to argue is that in fact, what you actually have is you have different, uh, you know, this should be straight line all the way up and right up to the lion. Why couldn't uh, God have created something like lions as a kind? And then they were preserved. Some of them were preserved in the fossil record. And then some of them survived because Noah brought them on the ark. And now we have lions. Uh, now, maybe you could say lions and tigers are related to each other and diversified after because their fossil record actually only goes back to uh, this 2.6 million years. But leopards, panthers, cheetahs actually go back farther than 2.6. And so it looks like there's separate lineages, tigers, leopards, panthers, cheetahs, the lineage that led to cats, right? When extinct lineages are considered that also straddle, right? When extinct lineages go across this boundary, 
in my mind, it would be far more consistent with the data to suggest that um, God created separate lineages of cats and Noah preserved them on the ark, rather than having to go through this complicated dance of explaining why um, uh, various cats seem to have existed prior to the flood, and then the very same exact versions of cats existed after the flood, even though they all weren't preserved through the flood, uh, except two individuals. Um, and Answers in Genesis has pointed something like this out as a problem for the, the ICR model. Thus far, ICR hasn't tackled this obvious challenge to their model in any significant way that I can see. They still talk about cats as if they're all one kind. But as they continue to push this recent flood boundary, maybe they'll revisit their, I'll call it inclusive view of kinds and the hyper evolution that this requires in favor of maybe a more limited understanding of kinds. And so we may end up with ICR arguing that there are many, many more kinds that God created than say Answers in Genesis does, which lumps all these different kinds of cats into just one single kind. Of course, this has implications for how many different animals um, Noah had to bring on the ark. Do you think I just picked um, a particular problematic group for this illustration? And maybe it's really not all that bad. Maybe the contrast isn't as great as I'm making it sound. No, I'm, I'm quite confident that we could apply the same analysis to all families of mammals, and almost all would exhibit a similar pattern to this feline family. Thus, AIG and ICR's significant flood boundary differences place enormous challenges on the two organizations finding to find any common ground on the pace and the origin of biological diversity and their definition of biblical kinds in particular. If they dig in on these positions, on, on their, their understanding of the geological history, it will certainly have an impact on their views of biological history. Not convinced? Let's, let's consider one more example, the great apes. I have written about answers in Genesis going all in on post-flood hyperspeciation their hyperspeciation thesis, that all the great apes, except humans, of course, belong to a single kind. And so chimps, gorillas, orangutans, all evolved from a common ancestral pair that walked off the ark just 4,350 years ago. As we can see here in this model, uh, that this, this model isn't challenged directly by a deep flood boundary uh, hypothesis. So if they have their boundary right here, um, then all of the various great apes only show fossils in the post-flood area. So they, so they could argue that God created a great ape preserved in the flood by Noah, and then after the flood began to diversify into these various separate lineages, which we now call chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and so forth. And humans, of course, were separate. Um, now, the very first uh, fossil lineage of any human is actually very, very high up in, in the fossil record. All right, so again, we see the same problem of there just aren't any fossils of any great apes in the fossil record at all. It's completely missing in their model of, of the flood uh, and the pre-flood rocks. Over here is a, a picture of their, um, in the flood, uh, sorry, in the Creation Museum, they have a new display there on who Lucy's relatives are, the great apes. And this shows you, this is exactly what they are presenting to their audience, right? They have, okay, you got an original great ape, that may have diversified pre-flood, right? That would be these rocks here, right? They're saying, oh, maybe this, this original ape I, I diversified into a variety of different kinds, or not kinds, different species of great apes before the flood. Well, then there's this flood, right? That kills, destroys all these different species. However, um, none of them were preserved in the flood rocks, at least that we have found. Uh, one lineage is preserved, right, by Noah, that then diversifies into a variety of extinct lineages. These are all extinct lineages that are found right in here. And some living lineages, right, that extend through all the way up to the present, like, and, and these, these dark orange lines represent where the fossil record actually shows their lineages. And those lineages end up being, you know, traveling through time here. Um, so they are showing post-flood diversification, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they call all these a single kind. Now, let's consider the ICR model compared to this, right? I don't think you're going to be surprised. You've, you've figured out the pattern, right? And this is why I'm saying that there's going to be, I could do this for 50 different families, and we would see the same pattern over and over and over again. Consider the ICR model and the grade 8 fossil record you'll quickly see that ICR 
should have a serious problem with the answers in Genesis thesis that all grapes are all grapes, all great apes are a single created kind. In their model, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans all have identical, files, identical fossils of those kinds in the upper flood deposits, which testify to the existence of these kinds of animals being present in those forms prior to the flood. I've yet to see ICR make any direct statement about whether they believe that chimpanzees are a different kind than gorillas, but I would think that they would be tempted to declare that these are all different kinds of apes, in contrast to their very public display in the Creation Museum which declares them to be a single kind, right? So I would think that they'd be tempted to say, look, chimpanzees were created here and then they were preserved through the flood and they exist today. They probably diverged into bonobos because they have a fossil record that only is contained in the post-flood era. So they could say there was speciation at that point. But the gorilla lineage goes all the way back through the post-flood rocks into the flood rocks. And so gorillas existed before and after the flood. And therefore it would seem logical to say that they existed all the way from the beginning, all right, from the creationist perspective, just like they claim that humans existed from the very beginning and persisted all the way through the flood, even though their fossil record is only found very late uh, in the um, geological column. All right, well, if you've made it this far, uh, with me in this video. Well, thanks. And I, but I want you to know that I've delivered my primary points. At this point, I'm going to provide a few caveats and provide some additional observations on some more minor issues in creationism. Let's go back to our first slide. Um, all right. Now, the first caveat I have here is that I recognize that this line or this boundary line in between the Noahic flood and post-flood boundary isn't necessarily a, a stark um, high contrast line, like it, it's shown here. Uh, this line could be quite fuzzy. And by fuzzy, I mean this. Um, you wouldn't necessarily be, you know, have layers that have solely flood deposits in them, although at some point you must have those. But you could have a situation where you had flood rocks placed down and then they get eroded. That erosion then deposits them somewhere else. And as they get eroded in the post flood world, right? Uh, some new organisms get mixed into those and deposited. So now there's a mixture of fossils. Those fossils are organisms that had already been deposited during the flood, but they get redeposited, mixed with organisms that were alive after the flood, and therefore you have a mixture of fossils. That could form a, uh, I'll call it a fuzzy boundary here, where it, there won't be any, there may be places in the world where there's a clear boundary, but there may be places in other portions of the geological column where it's not quite as clear. I'll grant that to the uh, young earth creationist that, that, that it's going to be hard to find that line uh, in particular. Now, one of the advantages of the answers in Genesis model is that there is a fairly distinct line uh, right here at 66 million years ago. And that's because you had what you had that giant asteroid that presumably struck the earth uh, and created a massive uh, extinction of a lot of different organisms. So what you see in the fossil record is right here, you do have a lot of lineages that come up and they just end right here, right? And I'm talking about from, from the secular perspective, there are many lineages of organisms like the dinosaurs, right? Lots of dinosaur lineages that come up here and they just disappear at 66 million years ago. Some of them disappeared before, but a lot of them disappear at the 66 million line. Um, and so that makes it fairly easy to uh, place the line here and say that, okay, anything that survived through that, right, is something that Noah preserved and then went on to diversify afterwards. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you the answers in Genesis actually has the same problem that ICR has, right? Because they have the problem of things diversified. It looks to be diversified here, and then they travel through the line right through the boundary and then somehow you're going to want to put those all together and say they're a single kind uh, that doesn't make sense you're gonna to have to say they're separate kinds if they fell over the boundary this is also true here there are families or there are organisms for which there are species that travel all the way through this boundary and inches in genesis would lump those together and say they're a single species they have the same problem but these species are not ones that are as easily recognizable and a lot of them are extinct groups um, that, that, that make it through this particular boundary and are extinct today. So it's not as obvious 
um, to the average person that they have the same issue in terms of how they they deal with this boundary layer and uh, their their definition of a biblical kind. All right, so there are also many other different versions of boundaries. Um, there are a few creationists that put the boundary even higher and just want to say the very, very, very tippy top of the fossil record is um, maybe something that happened in the post-flood world. And there are a few people that actually place the boundary uh, right down here. So only this is part of the flood and they have massive amounts of parts uh, that are in the flood afterwards. Um, AIG and, and ICR as a whole seem to have, you know, they've taken on positions of their main contributors. So I'll say that, you know, almost everybody at ICR really wouldn't, they would argue for this boundary. I think whether they have strong convictions or not, they as a group um, sort of get behind this idea and Answers in Genesis is the same way. They kind of, the other people that work there kind of get behind Andrew, Andrew Snelling and kind of support this particular view. So the, these two um, um, apologetics groups really are diametrically opposed, you know, in terms of their their ideas about the flood boundary, which then I think are going to create more rifts between these two organizations with respect to other ideas like what a biblical kind is. Um, now, Creation Ministries International, the other big organization uh, out there, they don't take a, as far as I can tell, a really strong position because they publish papers and views that are kind of a mixture of the two, and so they have they don't they don't really have a feel in terms of where they stand on this. I think they're taking more of a, we'll wait and see um, what happens. And then you have all these other young earth creationists out there that are independents that um, have a variety of different views that uh, that mostly fall into one of these two things, but they might have nuances to them. There are those that believe that all of this is in the flood record, all right? Everything above here is in the flood record. And maybe only just the smallest, thinnest slice of the fossil record is actually pre-flood world. Um, I, at, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I can't help but um, but ask the question: Why is this question unanswered? That doesn't seem to be for lack of effort. Why is there no consensus? Answers in Genesis and AIG or AIG and ICR have written long articles about why the deep, I'll call it the deep, and the shallow boundaries, respectively can't be the flood boundary. When I read those papers, I agree with nearly every point that each one makes. They each use perfectly reasonable argument and point to uh, compelling observations from the fossil and rock record that make the alternative viewpoints impossible. I don't expect this problem to ever be resolved, and I expect it to continue to be a thorn in the side of creationism. It can't be resolved if, in fact, there was no cataclysmic global flood just 4,350 years ago. They may be looking for something that, that just doesn't exist, but I don't expect their inability to find the events they are looking for will cause them to ask the real difficult question, which is maybe their understanding of scriptures may be incorrect. Maybe they're trying to force a round peg into a square hole, but that's another topic for another time. Hey, I'm back. Um, thanks for listening to my video. I, I hope you appreciate the content. If you did, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe to this channel for more things like this, where I discuss creationism. I have a, I have a, you know, this week in creationism, and I discuss many of the different scientific aspects of creation science. But I'm also very interested in delving into some of the theological issues as well, and we'll be touching on some of those in the future. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, that's it for me. I'm out of here. Bye bye.